I think there are a number of ways in which caring for our emotional well-being and our mental health contribute to society. First, of, of course, um, mental health and, and well-being are important for each of us uh, individually. Each of us wants to be uh, happy and satisfied with, with life, and while you know, emotions of, um, of sadness and some anxiety are, are a normal part of life, no one wants to be threatened by extreme depression or, or anxiety disorder. So it's important for us as, as individuals uh, to take care of our, our well-being. But in terms of contribution to society, there, there's also clear evidence, and it's obvious from experience also, that um, when, we're, when we're doing well, when we're not having mental health difficulties, we're, we're, we're more able to, to contribute, we're more able uh, to help others, we're more able to, to, to carry out our work, to make those important contributions uh, that, that we seek. Um, with regard to other reasons, there's also evidence that um, caring for our emotional well-being, our psychological well-being, contributes to our physical uh, health as, as, as well. So, you know, one could say that there's a real contribution to, to physical health, to our health care systems not being overtaxed by, by attending to those matters of, of mental health uh, and well-being. And then lastly, I would say, you know, emotional well-being is not just about um, feeling good or, or being happy, but having proper uh, control and balance and, and por proportion in, in our emotions, being able to regulate those well. And uh, understood classically, that issue of uh, emotion regulation is um, an important part of, of character, of, of, of virtue, the virtues of um, of fortitude and of, of, of temperance, of being able to seek what's good even in the face of, of difficulties and to moderate our, our own desires to help contribute to others is, is critical. And so I think emotional well-being, again, understood as inclusive of emotion regulation is, is, is important in shaping us as persons to be uh, who are meant to be and to contribute as much as possible. So again, I think um, attention to mental health and emotional well-being uh, contributes to our own lives and to the lives of others in these, in these very many different ways. I think it's important to talk about emotional well-being, uh, both from a scientific point of view and from an experiential point of view. I would never want to downplay um, the, the uh, stories and narratives we tell, the descriptions of what we're experiencing, the, the, the personal sharing uh, with, with others of, uh, of our emotions, of our experiences. But I do think it also makes sense to try to approach this question of emotional well-being through a scientific lens. Uh, I, I think it can be very helpful in um, describing what's going on with a particular group or, or population, what aspects of life are, are going well, which ones um, are not, how are things changing uh, over, over time, uh, studying questions of uh, well-being through that scientific lens can help us to see trends and to make us attentive to um, issues that need to be addressed within uh, society. How are social relationships changing? How are levels of mental health or happiness changing? Can policies be put in place that might help address these? So simply from a descriptive perspective, I think it can be quite helpful to approach this question of uh, emotional well-being through a, through a scientific lens. But that scientific lens is also important to help us to understand how to bring about uh, well-being. How, how can we contribute to this? So, for example, uh, randomized trials in the positive psychology literature have, have shown that uh, the simple practice of, um, of being grateful for things really does contribute to um, our happiness and our physical health and, and our mental health and our, and, and our sleep. Simply kind of writing down three things you're grateful for and why three times a week has these effects and can have these effects you know, months out. Um, and so we, we learn um, about how to improve well-being by, by studying it scientifically. You know, likewise, uh, doing five acts of kindness once a week uh, that one wouldn't otherwise ordinarily do. Uh, do this for, for six weeks and again, research indicating that this increases uh, levels of, 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 of happiness and of, of connection with, uh, with, with others. 
So we, we can understand these um, sorts of activities, gratitude, acts of kindness, using one's character strengths, imagining one's best possible self. These have all been shown uh, scientifically to enhance well-being. But the scientific literature on well-being also, I think, gives us yet deeper insight. Well, all of these individual activities, I think, are useful and important and, and should be widely distributed in, in schools and in workplaces and in community settings. Um, the research also makes clear that there are important uh, communal or institutional pathways that, um, that enhance uh, well-being. A lot of the individually based uh, well-being activities improve happiness and improve health. But if we think about other aspects of well-being, of, of flourishing, like meaning and purpose in life, or about good relationships, or about our, our character, I think the research indicates that we need uh, broader communal institutional commitments. Um, so, for example, a review of the scientific literature on well-being that we carried out at the Human Flourishing Program at Harvard you know, has indicated that in, in terms of things that are common in society and have important effects across these different areas of, of well-being, um, participation in, in education, in, in work, in family, and in religious community all have substantial effects on improving well-being. So that if individuals were to make efforts to participate in these institutions and if society uh, were to invest in, in supporting them, kind of communal levels of well-being, societal levels of well-being uh, would, would increase. So again, these are all insights that come from studying uh, well-being through, through a scientific lens. So I, I do think science has a great deal to contribute both to our understanding of well-being and to the promotion of well-being. At the Human Flourishing Program at Harvard, um, much of our work has been shaped around five domains of, of human flourishing. Uh, those are happiness and life satisfaction, physical and mental health, meaning and purpose, character and virtue, and, and close social uh, relationships. I think each of these five uh, domains of flourishing or uh, well-being uh, are, are nearly universally desired, and we have empirical data on, on this as well. Almost everyone really wants to pursue these things in, in, in life. I think each of those five domains um, is also important because they constitute ends in of themselves. They're sought for their own sake. They're not merely means uh, to other ends. So we also look at those means. I think the financial and material means to sustain flourishing are, are important. But in terms of what's sought for its own sake, again, I think those domains of happiness, health, meaning, character, and relationships really are critical. In terms of introducing them into educational contexts, uh, I think there are a number of different ways in which we can, we can do so. Um, first, I think um, bringing these questions to, to, to the students with regard to how important are these various aspects of, of, of life of happiness, health, meaning, character, relationships. How important are they uh, to get students to, to, to reflect on, on these matters? And again, I think experience generally shows that these things are important to, um, to, to just about um, everyone. But I, I think within education, more can be done as, as well. Um, I think we can start collecting data on how um, the various aspects of, of well-being are or are not present in different school contexts. It can make school teachers and administrators and leaders aware of um, what the strengths of a particular group of students are and, and where uh, students may need help. I think this can often provide uh, considerable insight. Uh, in one study we carried out of medical residents at uh, at um, Johns Hopkins University, we found that across the domains, they were struggling most with physical and mental health. And, and these were um, uh, fellows who were being prepared to be uh, physicians. So this should give us you know, cause for, for concern and, and should lead to questions as to how we might uh, rework the structures in place to, to help support the physical and, and, and mental health. Of the, of the medical residents. So again, I think a lot of insight can come simply from uh, the collection of data. But I do think education is also uh, uniquely positioned to help contribute to uh, these various domains of, of, of flourishing. 
Um, students are in a formative time in, in, in life. They're often at the period where they're trying to determine and discern what their principal uh, purpose is are. Uh, I think there's evidence also that um, you know, character is, is being formed and that this is perhaps an especially sensitive period for the formation of character. Uh, many of the relationships that students build in uh, school or university uh, settings carry on uh, through, through, throughout life. Um, the health behaviors that one establishes, exercise, sleep, nu nutrition are often shaped during this time uh, as well. So I do think um, uh, efforts within schools and universities to uh, help students flourish in each of these ways uh, really is quite important. I uh, would still maintain that the principal function of schools and universities is to, you know, to, to, to develop knowledge and the you know, cognitive capacities for the pursuit of knowledge, for the pursuit of truth and, and understanding. And I, I think we shouldn't lose that as a, a central focus. And that itself, of course, does contribute uh, to subsequent flourishing of students. But I think to the extent that time and resources allow the promotion of these other aspects of flourishing can and should be done as well. Uh, so we have, in fact, just completed a first wave of data collection of a global flourishing study to try to gain what one might call epidemiologic insight into the mental health and, and well-being of, of people globally. Uh, this global flourishing study, uh, data collection carried out uh, from Gallup, and is a study of 200,000 individuals in 22 different countries on all six populated uh, continents, representing about half of the world's population. And we've been looking at different aspects of mental health and well-being and flourishing and, 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 and the determinants. Um, and, and some of the results actually are quite um, startling. Uh, with regard to what, what may be happening with, with, with young people. Um, so the traditional patterns of well-being and age uh, that have been found for, for many years often focused on happiness and life satisfaction, uh, but those patterns have generally been U-shaped with younger people and older people generally doing better than those uh, midlife who are perhaps struggling with young children and aging parents and, and career challenges. Um, but what we've found over time in the United States and, and now with this Global Flourishing Study in many other countries is that that left part of the U has been flattening. Um, young people aren't doing as well um, as, they, as they used to be. There are, I think, real and new and, and difficult challenges with regard to mental health. Uh, and well-being. So in the United States, for the first time in 2022, we found each of these dimensions uh, strictly increasing with, with age. And we've, we've found that in a number of other uh, countries as, as, as well, in Argentina and Brazil and, and, and Australia. Um, it's not the case uh, everywhere in um, our data in uh, Egypt or India, for example. It still very much looks uh, U-shaped. Um, <coughs> In Spain, it's quite interesting where it, it actually looks mostly U-shaped, except the youngest group, 18 to 24, has the lowest level of, of well-being in, in, in these assessments. So we're still trying to understand and make sense of these uh, global patterns, but I think we've seen enough to, to know that the mental health and well-being of, of young people globally are, are a real concern. And, um, even in countries where that's not yet the case, um, we should perhaps be prepared with regard to what we've seen happening in, in other countries. So I do think more work needs to be done on, on mental health and well-being of, of young people and providing the um, social resources and emotional resources that are necessary, providing um, care and, and counseling when, uh, when that seems appropriate, thinking about the societal structures that support um, the well-being of, of young people, thinking about matters of education and economic opportunities and, and that. Uh, also thinking about difficult questions concerning social media use and the role that this might be playing in um, what we've been seeing as declines in the mental health and well-being of young people. So I, I think we need to approach this uh, on, on multiple fronts, but the data that we've had from this Global Flourishing Study I think are a real cause for concern and point to real need for societal um, change and change in, in policy on addressing these matters. Okay. I'm certainly very grateful for the opportunity to, to 
have this interview and to be able to share some of our work and uh, well-being to everyone listening. I, I um, do think this time of uh, education, of, of, of learning, is, is an extraordinary uh, one. I think the, um, what, what one learns at this time of, of, of life, the, the formation of one's purposes, the development of, of one's character when one's going through the process of education just opens up all sorts of uh, opportunities. I think it can be um, sometimes challenging to, 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 to look ahead and to ponder the future, to, to think about the, the difficulties that one might encounter and the difficulties that we face in our world at, at present. But I do firmly believe that uh, education offers an extraordinary opportunity to try to gain that understanding, to become equipped uh, with the, the tools one needs for, for one's um, career journey and one's life journey. So uh, I would strongly uh, encourage everyone to spend time uh, learning, but also thinking about life, thinking about uh, flourishing and the pursuit of flourishing for oneself and also for society at large. <laughs>